Good day. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, yeah. Uh, lots and lots happening. Looking for the land and <clears throat> building and doing economic analysis and stuff. Uh, so the short of the economic analysis is that the strip down, so, so the current 60, it's like 59, 59K is the BOM, I, I actually went through it. If you add another thousand to the back and make it a twice as big, it's 90,000. And okay. And um, which makes me lean, uh, like right now in the middle of the debate, the thousand is gonna be a hard sell actually. But it's just <coughs> high price. 2000 is much more sellable. Um, the realtors are telling us it's like no comps. You know, you have no comps. Nobody builds a thousand. Therefore, you have no clue. Now, in the last year, eight houses sold, and they were on average in St. Joe, on average, a hundred years old at that size. So, uh, a few years ago, I learned that to run a business, you have to make more money than you spend. Two days ago. I learned that you have to build a product that people want to buy. So I don't know what that means. I, I, I'd lean towards, I would do a thousand and a two thousand build, <clears throat> maybe, or just two thousand. Yeah, the economics on a hundred are, the thousand are just more difficult because you've got all the utilities, it's, as you saw the numbers, 60 and 90. Yeah. So that's where we're at. and. Uh, still working on working on that meeting with the people tomorrow. So tomorrow we're gonna just hit some triggers. Yeah, people are really good. Yeah, they found some pretty cool guys. Uh, there's a guy in town called Brent. His friends actually are realtors, and the ladies are very helpful. They're it's really good. So they they love this stuff. They're they're like all getting excited about that. We're meeting tomorrow with their their head guy who might have some insights on land because he's well connected in St. Joe. But they're also interested in the mission. They're kind of mission driven people so it's really nice that's where we're at okay uh engineers uh, i called them last week they're, they're saying this week okay um did you watch the recording yet or read the email i read the follow email. up yeah. yeah so so that that's basically it i mean we the balls in our court for the apprenticeship I'm concerned about the grant insofar as uh, uh, just getting all the work we have to, and like given you're going on vacation, and I, you know, Brian's been kind of MIA, so I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if we're if I'm going to be able to do this on my own. Um, just kind of gauging your interest, see see what you're feeling. Yeah, um, man. Without Brian, we're not scoring on those other things. What's what's happened to him? Is he you know, oh, I don't think I don't think there's anything wrong. I just I mean it, the schedule conflicts recently. Uh, was he supposed to appear today? Yes, uh, he suggested this time. Okay, well, hopefully, we, yeah. I mean, if, if he doesn't appear, also, are you recording right now? Do you want me to record? Uh, yeah, I'm recording. I'm recording now. Without his assistance on that, uh, it's like there's some weak points we have that we were thinking that or no i mean i think it, it uh i think a lot of questions need uh someone with your knowledge about the product um like specifically the budget narrative right so yeah, yeah. um th that that to me is a huge time I mean, sink I, mean, I, and could, I could do that now do i have the time to do that um it's due October 29th, so we still have time. It seems like, you know, getting a cup, like a day or two solid work on it. I understand that's the most important. I do believe that's the most important. I think the budget narrative, yeah, I think we can sweeten it up, focusing on on the quality of the program, right? Not a lot of infrastructure. I mean, what do you, what do you think about the rapid learning environment and the learning base and all that? Because I think that's that's... To, in my view, that's some of the biggest challenges we're struggling with is how do you transfer all this knowledge to become an integrated builder as opposed to a guy who spends, you know, five years learning how to do one thing. So, yeah, that yeah, no, totally. I, 
I think to do that right, uh, getting the equipment's not enough. We have to have like staff dedicated to manage yeah. it and and yeah. run it, and that to me is a uh, downstream or like has to happen after we build the house, build the second house, and start the apprenticeship. So I think the apprenticeship needs to start if we have two options. We can like take an MB appro MVP approach to the apprenticeship, or we can wait until we can build the the bays and the things that you described in the email. And like to me, the MVP form of the apprenticeship is the two two house builds as like pilot proof of concepts are done before the spring, yeah. and then in the spring we recruit for 24 people under the home performance laborer partnered with MCC. And the experience is not gonna be on, like you won't have the infrastructure on the OSE campus yet, but you will have a like a business set up to start running apprentices through and build the houses. And they'll be taking classes at MCC. So it's like, it's, it's not the collaborative learning model that we originally envisioned with the production technologies, but it gets us closer um, because you've, now you've got a product on the market, you have a revenue stream, you have potentially enough capital to like start paying people to manage that. So like the way I think that would happen is <clears throat> you successfully launch the apprenticeship, you prove the, the viability of it as an enterprise, and then you start hiring staff to manage that so then you can focus on the infrastructure. And, and turning the apprenticeship into the the more refined yeah. uh, integrated learning. <clears throat> yeah, that's the thing. For the apprenticeship, I can do what I can uh, in in terms of teaching. But the the block there. I mean, I agree with you. First of all, I agree with you exactly. We do launch a business, and when money comes in, whether it's from our business or from the government. It's going. Everything is going to rapid education infrastructure, and of course teaching. Because my my goal is to unload the teaching as soon as we hire capable staff. That's the thing. Now that staff is going to be in trouble without the curriculum. That's why all that energy is basically by curriculum. We mean documentation, the 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 learning, the the learning. That's gonna yeah be like, yeah all of that 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 is the key it's about transfer of knowledge and we're investing all that into it for scalability yeah but i don't care if we get the money or not i want to run this i want to show a viable business model <clears throat> yeah i mean if we imagine a world in which we don't get the arpa funding right it, yeah. or we choose not to apply whatever you still have Novo Foundation money that you can start the enterprise yeah. with yep. and then proceed there. What the ARPA grant does for us, though, is it drastically increases the rate at which you can start implementing infrastructure around the apprenticeship. Yeah. And the, the money that we can request can span from January of next year to 2026. Yep. But it's all like <clears throat> reimbursement style, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, that's that's awesome. Uh, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, hey, Brian. I was meeting hey, with the local neighborhood association leader, and it was going long. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How are y'all? Yeah, good. I just had an updated on the cost structure is 60k for the materials for a thousand square feet, and 90k for materials for 2,000 square feet. Now that includes PV, five kilowatts of PV. So wow. that's all right. But plus look at labor, 000, right? Well, labor is not in there, but right. But look at ninety thousand for two thousand square feet. That that gets. That's why I'm like, hey, do we want to build a two thousand square foot in the first batch? So do a thousand and a two thousand. That's kind of how I'm thinking about because it, it's like the reality check for me recently has been uh, is the reason why people don't build small houses. It's not as a cost-effective per square foot, by all means. So right. we, could, we could really rely on a grow home concept, the incremental housing concept, and really max that out. And try to really, for the 2,000, it's like, uh, it's 90,000, but it's actually, without carport, it's actually less. It's going to be 85 or less. 
It's going to be 85 about without carport. So it's actually, uh, let, yeah, let me correct for clarity, 60 and 85 without car, 60 with carport, 85 without carport for double the space. That's not too bad. What, what's all in? Like, to me, it's helpful to think about it all in. Yeah, but including the labor it varies greatly. The labor for the first one, uh, the more realistic now, got, gone through some numbers, 26K for the small one and 26 plus uh, 13, so 39 for the big one. At what, what wage rate? 32, 80. Now that's, that's a lot less than 180. Hmm? That's less than 180. I thought we were at 180. Yeah, but all in, like, yeah, so what's the land, what's the legal, and all that. Like, there's a bunch of other costs. Yeah. So, like, util the utility connections, the biggest one, the biggest variable is land cost. I mean, basically, what we're finding out is you can get a get a lot, they're cheap, 5K and up. Or you can go into the desirable neighborhoods where we actually found we can't build. With the two lots we were looking at for 40K, no go. HOAs. Why? Cookie cutter development. Brian, would you live in a cookie cutter development? Maybe. But that's basically where those nice, those what, you so mean like nice, a, nice like neighborhoods a, in a development. I, I mean, I think uh, probably. Yeah. But they won't let us build there. So now with the two thousand, we didn't ask about the two thousand. But it is about size and style. So it has to kind of match the style around, and we don't match the style around. We don't have the standard gable roof house. Yeah. But I am committing, like in those numbers, I am including the PV because that saves you a thousand bucks a year in utility costs. Plus, I mean, I have to, I should have the number in terms of pounds of carbon dioxide. It's it's yeah. huge. That, yeah, I, I'm not gonna go without that We're, because we gotta be true to eco. Plus, it's just a good idea. It just saves you money. It's like yeah, you gotta pay up, but it just saves you money. And and we can have that as an option. Like if you don't want it up front, make it make the cost real real cheap. Um, we go down to. 55 and 80. Man, that was numbers are looking good. 55 and 80 without PV. Well, um, and you're still focused on St. Joseph, right? Yeah. Could be anywhere, but I mean, that's a convenient place. That's uh, Brent, but Brent you're is the buddy from town. He's actually a guy uh, who contacted me here. He's the, uh, he found out about the TED Talk and all that. So he's, uh, he connected me to the realtors in, in uh, St. Joe from Berkshire Hathaway, who actually gave us $150,000. <laughs> well, yeah, a few, a few removed, yeah. A couple of spots removed from that, but yeah. Um, but yeah, they're kind of shaking me down. And uh, yeah, like the, the deal is like, the, the, the facts are that nobody builds a thousand square foot houses and they're, they're for a couple without children that means one sixth of the market so we have to start with that premise so right there we would say well you can't when you talk about big, the big solve housing thing well you can only solve it for one sixth of the population there and that so that's the kind of reality check meaning it translated to in practice it's longer times to sell you're yeah. on the market and it doesn't get snapped up immediately maybe because there's one sixth of the people looking at it well, um, and I didn't understand what you said about the 40K cookie cutter in a good place that you can't Land build. Land around St. Joseph costs 40K in the good parts of town. And it's, it's actually between 40 and 60. Now, in a ghetto, you can get lots for 5 to 10K. Or like the low cost, the, in, in town here, I can get a lot for 10K. So, so that kind of, this is just difference in economics for what the sale price has to be. Mm. Yeah, but like I'm thinking, well, for the, for the Kansas City, the land trust, oh man, you know, three thousand dollar and up lots. So so we have to have a model that's like way stripped down. Um, but unfortunately, it's hard to do with well, a small house. But we can do it. Without, yeah. Say without Why don't we you just forty? 
Yeah, we, we need a we'll, we'll we'll create our own mortgage house, and we'll build them and finance them for people who typically wouldn't be able to. Right, exactly. So we can do a cross subsidization model. Now the real deal is why I'm not afraid to go into the 2000, which is like away from solve this thing of affordable housing because it's larger and stuff. Well, one people want that, but we're funding the CB and plastic. So we're, pl we're funding the CB and 3D printing. I looked at those numbers, and the realistic numbers from 60 go down to 30 for what we can, just substituting the cost of lumber and all the plastic parts. Because th that's why we got to take that money, put it into R&D of the high temperature, large scale printers. And that's how we reduce the cost of that. So it's a not an immediate thing. And of course, as we were always saying, but it becomes very clear what's required. And what's required is probably two million bucks to get there. Yeah. So that's like 10 R&D people for one year on the printer. And also 10 R&D well, people If we get started a... For if one we year. use John's company or started a company, we could probably access the Cibber money. Which would be really helpful. Yeah. What about SBIR and STTTR? They're like um, uh, AFWorks, uh, yeah. government grants. Look, guys, the numbers are one million net if we succeed at the twenty-four person apprenticeship. So if we succeed at the 24-person apprenticeship and we're selling houses on the thousand square, based on the thousand square foot where the revenue was 25 as our profit, so called profit, it's a million bucks. And that's for 50 houses per year. We should be able to build 75 with 24 people. So yes to all those other grants, but I mean, immediately I, I'm like, let's just develop the business model. Because it's a million bucks after one year. That's more than that's more than that's faster than Cibber. Because you can only get like five hundred. Isn't it like five hundred k for? Well, 50, 50 homes from zero to fifty is is a big assumption. It's a big assumption, but um, from an operations I, and I would say I mean that's the land acquisition part. I think with the new contacts and the real estate <coughs> added. Then it's about yeah operations management for the for the thing. So that means a construction manager, but um, uh, there's the back end of all the sourcing and stuff. So there's a, there's a bit of that. Now assuming we've got the apprenticeship, there's also revenue that comes in from that which, with which we hire staff. So that that's how I see it doable. So apprenticeship, four support staff, and we build fifty houses at least the first year. What revenue from the apprenticeship are you referring to? Clouds, a uh, revenue. Uh, John, you're asking what revenue from the apprenticeship? Yeah, wh what are you referring to? Tuition. Yeah, uh, yeah, but that's can't be, can't be all all through. Well, look, uh, there's. What? Yeah, right, right. With what you said regarding the apprenticeship, but I'm not assuming that we're going to be getting 24 people from the standard apprenticeship programs, which probably start with like a couple of people or a few people so between that and paying people where we guarantee that we pay you um, a competitive wage at the top of the pay scale after six months so I'm assuming that we're going to be able to get people to pay for that um, now with the government apprenticeship no we're paying people but if we're out there very quickly starting to build housing, there's revenue coming from housing. So we can go evaluate some ready scenarios. I mean, initially we can do the training on real builds too. So there would be revenue coming in. And maybe it's, uh, we have to think about what percentage of class time versus build time but I think it would be fair to say 50-50. Um, I, don't, I don't have a strong uh, emotional attachment to any course of action here. I'll, I'll just say that if you want the DOL apprenticeship 
with the MCC providing the related training instruction, there's there are, are certain constraints that they're not going to negotiate on. And one of those constraints is like the number of hours they have to be in the classroom. Uh, and those class classroom times are going to be out of our hands. So they'll say like, yeah. you know, every Friday three to six is your intro to electronics for every apprentice that goes in that. And we won't be able to start an apprentice class until, you know, so we'll have to work around the school schedule there, for example, if that's the route that we go, go to. And similarly with the Department of Labor, they're not going to sign off on an apprenticeship program unless we're guaranteeing an hour uh, average of 30 hours paid labor a week, right? Yeah. And so like, yeah. no conflict there, right? But yeah. if you're talking about mixing that program with a pay to play program, that's like an educational experience for six months. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I'd have to think about like how that would work. Cause like, what you're gonna have are people who are paying to be there to learn this, go through the same experience as somebody who's an apprentice there who's being paid. Not exactly paid. the same. It, it'll be, there, have to be some di there would have to be some differentiation because if one's paying and the other one's not, the program must be right. different. But I could right. see different tracks. Like one track is bam, you're just here to learn and, and be a worker. Another yeah. one is, okay. oh, you're here, you're here, you're learning to be a designer or a okay. manager. Or who else? Who else is there? I mean, that's pretty much design and management are the and entrepreneurship tracks. So, um, I uh, thinking about that. I don't think there's necessarily a conflict there. I think uh, we could work together. I no, uh, you, you can even you can even have the apprenticeship program on paper that you request that we build the, the grant around so like, we can get approved for it and just not even start it until we're ready. You know what I'm saying? Like you can be approved now. Yeah. If there's other parties like MCC providing the schooling, hey, it's a load off me and we can provide that aspect and we don't have to spend time on it. Maybe our program is OK. Now here you learn about collaboration, how to collaborate on large scale projects, design and build anything. That would be right. maybe the paid track, you know. Which right. Probably what, yeah, yeah. So there will be, we have to define very clear and then break it down what are the hours, what kind of hour schedules are for each and go from there. But I mean, to me, it seems like if there's MCC involved, um, then my only practical question is there, well, what's the revenue share model there? Like, so did the grant just go to go to MCC and that's it? The, their, their ability to provide our related training instruction is completely self-funded. Oh, so, you didn't, <clears throat> so we're not paying for that. So right. it looks like everything's here is synergistic. Yeah, so I don't know exactly. What the, yeah, what the constraint is there. Yeah, I mean, if they're, so they're getting a different pot of money. Um, right. And what is, yeah. what is that pot of money there? And for how many people? Um. I, f I forget. Um, it's we're not going to ex exceed their capacity, though. Yeah, we got to so we, we got to offer like um. How does the co-op play into this? Because right, you know, like if I, I can already hear people complaining about oh you're getting paid or for us to build this house and we're paying you. <clears throat> if you had some sort of co-op ownership model oh, where they were also owners or they oh, could become owners then it would really um i think balance out the value proposition oh, yeah. for people long term okay flesh it out flesh it out man put, put that on paper okay. exactly what those terms would look like and let's consider it okay um, yeah so we can have I, this pack. I, what i'm trying to figure out is that and then related to the yeah. arpa grant like go no go is if Bob and I are really focused on this Kansas City Climate Corps. We we're we have like a similar target audience, and we could you know you already have so much knowledge in terms of aquaponics and in terms of you know all the other you know mushrooms and things that you know March and like if we expanded this concept and applied together, I think we would have a stronger, a very strong yeah. application because. And like, is that is that crazy? Is that stupid? No, should we? Should I? I think that's synergistic. Get in on the, get in on some money to develop the aquaponics model, which could be on the what? 
the aquaponics. So that's part of the house. That's part of the house thing. We, we want to offer the aquaponics. Turnkey one is a turnkey build, and two, a turnkey service. So, because people, a lot of people, like say you're busy at your job, you might want to hire a contract guy who just comes into your greenhouse once a week, and you just harvest. That's a business. Yeah. So something like that, a turnkey service. So food as a service. And digital. Well, so it's we, different. I mean, let me explain what the K Climate Core is, yeah. and we can see if how if it all relates because it's a it's solving a different problem, which is climate mitigation for cities. Yeah. So it's like, um, you know, cities are going to get hotter and wetter, and we need to sequester carbon, and there's all these kind of blank sort of so basically the climate core we're building two things one is the urban ecosystem standard which is a network of you know sensors and iot across the city that, that defines what is health so there's protocols around heat around flooding around uh sequestration soil health and then that's like the iot of you know, the urban ecosystem health, what is health, and then the climate core is dedicated to planting trees and mitigating those issues. Maybe it's, maybe they're just different ideas and different concepts, but if there's a way to merge them, we we're there's talking a, about like... There's huge overlap, man. Generation. If you talk okay. about planting trees, you're talking about integrated food service. It's, it's edible landscape plus aquaponics plus whatever is allowed. So the tree planting is right there with aquaponics. If you want to talk about what's a tomato from California, put a tomato in a quart jar and pour gasoline in the spaces that fit in between. That's how much gas you're getting with that tomato. So make food local. That's climate. The, the aquaponics is climate. That's called local food uh, in a very substantial way because the productivity is insane. Yeah. Uh, third, we already do the standard option. We're making the PV a standard. We're not just saying like, no, we, we'll, we'll definitely, we're not gonna cut out the PV. Maybe if you force us to, but we're gonna be building PV on everything. So on every house, five kilowatts. <laughs> so that's climate. So I, those are the, I mean, there's very clear overlap here. Now, if you get into, of course, the building materials like the CBs, that I showed you some of those numbers. What, what was that, like one sixth uh, CO2 of, of lumber? something like that so okay but that means uh so what what's it but my, yeah, i'm like kind of confused what so what is it the climate core guys what are they are they taking actually class to actually execute on this They're yeah so yeah, we so, would so let's do it so bob and i are thinking about pulling together let's call it regeneration university and open source manufacturing would be part of that but we'd also combine it with Ag regenerative agriculture and circular economy and you know like it would be an expanded apprenticeship and if that what I like about this Marchin is that all the the stuff that you don't really like to do we would probably be able to do that for you like the you know the little present on people's beds when they arrive you know that kind of <laughs> you know, oh, I hate doing that. Program management, you know, <laughs> softening the blow of like the brute force of, you know, being out there in the hot sun. You need someone to kind of like that bedside manner, you know, the people to basically yeah, fill out all the gaps around you. So when you come in and you're like inventor marching showing up, they're all like primed and ready. Yeah. But I think if they try and if, if it's only you, then people get exhausted and yeah but no no kidding yeah. man like i'm doing only me because we ain't got no money to pay anybody i mean with the resources well, but, we can actually fill in all the gaps right yeah but i i don't know if we're two trains going in different directions and it's like it sounds like it, they fit together but they're actually don't you know i don't okay, know so john what's missing? so what's missing well See, yeah i mean my just to val validate it could be it. really amazing because the co-op for me is a DAO. Like what you said, could it be a DAO? Yeah, it could be a fucking DAO. Like that can be the entity that gets all the cyber money. 
it could be the entity that you know right but i think we have to focus right now okay so we're training people so this is school so what is the school what is the curriculum and what is the job that they're getting afterwards so what is the revenue model because i can tell you we're going to build a house we're going to get x dollars so what's the revenue model for what we're doing here well one immediate thing i could propose is that you think about it as this is all open source product development so it's like yeah that's what it is and then we're producing people that we can hire uh very likely now they can also go off on their own but i know that's much harder so it's probably yeah and we can hire them so what do we hire them for yeah to me hire there's three tracks there's three tracks one is they after they complete the apprenticeship they join up and that means that they're Join basically Bob. being hired well yeah the Kate they're they're joining the DAO or the co-op and there the there's an open position to pay them the second is they see one of these open source businesses that they want to start and we're gonna help incubate them and the third is we help them get placed into existing company that needs a job like Missouri organic or ripple glass so those are three different routes one is entrepreneurial one is you know being part of an owner worker cooperative essentially and the third is you know job placement yeah so being specific on each one of those, like the third one i would say like okay the flags i i see there is that to get hired by a regular business sure but you don't need art then they don't do any of the stuff we do we do crazy shit a regular business you just go to some other training or tech school and work for them so i don't see how our program would serve like you getting placed into another that would be hard because who's who, who you know who's trying to for example well just do what we do right it's, it's well it, it's because the only way we'd be able to do that is because we've expanded the curriculum to be beyond just osc to include other modules and other groups that um, where they can specialize. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. To me, this is kind of like: can our work streams combine in a way that you know self reinforce each other? Because if that's if it does, I'd be happy to work on this grant, and I think that I can bring in a lot of yeah. letters of support so, to make it happen. Uh, I just don't want to take us all down a direction that's. You know, because I I care a lot about your focus. You know, but if it if it can be the same thing, then you not only have me on this grant, but you know I I'll do this entity and all these other things too, because that's ultimately what I want. I think. Okay, but so the missing part for me: what are the revenue models that we're training for? What are the products and production that we're training for? That's the thing. So what's the answer to that? Unless we have a clear answer for that, then we're just doing something that's just high risk. You train all these people. There's and they they can't get paid. That's what happened to us last year already. We tried to train people for the CD go home. We found it was harder harder than we think. We didn't have ready products that we can productize and get revenue. So you're asking for that without defining some very clear products. Yeah. Well, my products are a little bit different, and it relates to a few different things. But okay. My products are, uh, in a way, the, um, you know, I feel like if I spent some time, I could answer that question, like, even better. But my short answer for the, my short answer is, I believe that I can sell outcomes as the product. So reduce risk with data attached to it. So basically, there's this whole thing called outcome-based financing. You know, think of like the financial instrument of a carbon credit is all it is is data that is proven that reduces carbon. Yeah. And so um, we're defining a new standard for ecosystem health, urban ecosystem health. And I'm going to go around town getting 
companies to commit money instead of buying carbon credits from China to buy urban ecosystem health credits. So the product is actually those, you know, improvements in outcomes and health outcomes. So it could be, um, so, I mean, that that's essentially, I, I also have other value. So that's one of them is just these outcomes are, if you have the IOT infrastructure, the the data allows you to create these ecosystem assets and these assets are tradable and they're you know these outcomes are things that these large companies will pay for it is it is risk because i haven't sold one yet but different members of my team before have sold you know 10 million dollars to microsoft or you know i i do feel like i can i can pull that off um and that will you know, the, we're making the ecosystem a client in the urban ecosystem standard, and it's directly focused on climate mitigation and resilience. So we can include, you know, outcomes in health related to, to food. We can include, you know, like I was just talking to a neighborhood, a poor neighborhood leader today, the life expense expectancy in her neighborhood is 20 years less than other neighborhoods. So if I can increase, if I can, th there's already green bonds right now that will pay for that type of outcome. All we need is the data to back it up. And the urban ecosystem standard makes a customized deal into a, something that could be happening a lot more often. Um, so, mm -hmm. th so that that's where I think a lot of revenue will come from. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted, I want to create. You know, I've been thinking about like, um, you know, the, the narrative for climate has changed so much that it's like I do believe that if if I go out and ask people if they have climate anxiety, they will say yes. Everybody has insurance. So there's value creation scenarios that I feel like can come up with. It's not the product is actually the the outcome and the data that we feel like we can produce in terms of reduced risk. But you know, um, okay, yeah. I mean, so so the name but also the mm. the food, the food and the nuts and you know that was the other piece is you know the 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 animal husbandry and the food coming off the land management side is also another so actually I'm sorry I didn't I'm not really presenting it very well but there's outdoor recreation revenue from like the river kayaking and things like that rentals there's um, food and um, from the trees and the you know the farming and there's um, the outcomes I think are like the main ones let me see if okay, I, so I think, what else I think for this to work out, I think the common ground has to be, I mean, what we do is teach people to produce things. So the only thing that I heard in your thing, which, which is substantial, is food production. So can we collaborate on, because we teach people to, to build things or to produce things. The other things are financial products or other organizational products, which... That's good, but I, I wouldn't say that's uh, with OSC we go about saying we we'd like to create fundamental solutions to pressing world issues, and our premise on that or our assumption that is that oh just fix the material reality, eliminate artificial scarcity and all that everything else goes away. So I think that's the fundamental, that's the first principles approach. So um, the other things like the financial products, I mean I, I would call it. Um, it's it's like a financial product. It's like I don't know I don't know what they call it, but it's not a productive physical production product, which is what we do. So we can't. I'm I'm not sure there's good overlap in, in things that are not really physical production related. Like even if I talk about any like IT stuff, like oh this massive online multiplayer game or this DAO or whatever, it has to be the product is some production. So for the game, the massive online game, that's the house. We're, it's just supporting that building of moving dirt and trees and, and building houses. So 
very much physical asset based. Also, trail building. There's a lot of money in trail building. Yeah, uh, could be. And then, of course, yeah, I mean, uh, right. So for scalability, is there a model that we can that's reliable there, you know, and risk and all that? So I mean, yeah, yeah, it could be. But that's a, that's enough of an overlap. You said. Yeah. You're you're saying the overlap is aquaponics essentially. Edible landscapes and aquaponics. Yeah. Distributed urban gardening, which I believe is going to be the future. So part of the stuff that we want to do with the autonomous vehicles and all that, make distributed community supported agriculture feasible. Right now I could be driving my delivery drone to a customer in Maysville, that kind of stuff. So so it's the transportation, the, the logistics part, the simplify. But once again, it's hardware. It's, it's like it's your little drone that drives around on solar or whatever. Um, so yes, physical production, food so, systems. Yes, uh, there's great potential. Like so, with the housing, like one thing to you know, when I think about it, it's kind of hard to enforce. But as we do the housing, we start building in edible landscapes. My my experience, just just for your back, the story behind that is in Madison. I basically went around the neighborhood and I said, I knocked on some doors and I said, Hey, can I plant stuff in your garden? And yeah, so I had like 10 or 20 spots around town. I would plant tomatoes, plant a bunch of trees from donations from Stark Brothers, which are actually in Missouri and stuff like that. So there was a bunch of food growing in distributed locations in Madison and still is <laughs> um, with the trees that were planted. So I, I think the distributed gardening is a great, that's, that would be awesome. And imagine now automating some of that and creating business models like food as a service around that. But that is fundamentally physical production and it is addressing the carbon stuff. Uh, yeah, that is, I see as an overlap. And the houses, I think, you know, if we can, we can really do that, then that would be a huge addition. I mean, food and shelter. Well, that's the goal. But the thing is, it's like we're just trying to bootstrap somehow so we can get some money that we can knock this out of the ballpark. I mean, yeah, yeah. So once again, the well, is it just a big distraction? Sorry, just to back up for to close up the former discussion. So from 60k, my my reality is, uh, I invested in physical production. Now I can produce the house at 30k in materials, replicably. Not not just like one off labor of love. So this is hugely scalable, 30k per house, which means we can take the 5,000 gigawatt and build there and make a product that we can sell, and uplift the local community. It's going to be much cheaper. Okay, but that's that's just closing up the discussion from before. Go ahead. Well, where I'm, um, what I appreciate where we're at here. We're saying that the the overlap is distributed, urban, edible landscapes, physical production, and uh, you know the aquaponics. Yeah. Right, I think the aquaponics is the most tangible because you already have it, right? And it's not like yeah. too much out of your, you know, current exactly focus. Yeah, we because the land management stuff, we can get other people to train, you know, and yeah. so this grant would be, you know, I'm I'm, I'm trying to pull together a bunch of different partners. There might be I mean, one piece of it that open source ecology does that's housing and aquaponics. And there's a bunch of other things that other organizations do. And together, we're winning this big multi-million dollar yeah, sure. grant. That's how it would have to happen. Sure, I would also want to add, we do have extensive edible landscaping experience. The 10,000 nuts we planted, of which very few survived. Uh, edible, the nursery, the whole whole orchard here we propagated it all from seed and, and grafting and all that. We've got perhaps the mo like you'd probably like if you don't have the eyes, you'd, you'd see this this site as a total mess. But if you can see it, pro we probably have more species of edible plants than any place in Missouri, except for like Stark Brothers, which does that for a living. Yeah, I mean, so we do have a lot of that experience, and that's to be maxed out. I mean, I see the completely self-food-sufficient, food energy-fuel-sufficient. You've got enough PV on your rooftop that you're making hydrogen for your car. That's, that's where I'm taking this to. I want to take this to. And your little micro factory can be producing stuff in your garage or whatever. You're, there's a lot of foodstuffs you can be growing. 
and the energy you have the house is all off grid because it's got enough solar power on top yeah but that's that's the kind of package and yeah we want to bring as many people to make all those pieces happen and the only thing is being distributed and open source which by the way could be a challenge as, as you see because that's a, you know we have that requirement But yeah, yeah, and there's there's a definite overlap. Well, that that's good news. I don't know, uh, as the witness, John. What do you what do you say? Uh, do you want a general reaction to the conversation that happened, or do you have a specific, like, something more specific you want to know? We'll start with the general reaction and go into any. Uh, and then maybe we can ask for specifics. Yeah, I mean, my general reaction is like, it's a beautiful vision. I just didn't want to interrupt. Um, and uh, all I'm thinking, like my focus for the past, you know, several months has been, what's the next step to bring, uh, bring that into focus? Like what's the next practical, yeah. accomplishable thing that we can do? And uh, when I brought this grant forward to you guys, um, I was under the assumption that the next thing that we would do was build a house and, and start the apprenticeship. Um, so that that's where I'm at. Is if that's or if we're going to change that, um, you know, now would be a good time to know. No, no, no change. It's, okay. it's the, the whatever the aquaponics. All that, that's the house. That's a better house problem. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just just to look here, here, based on my conversations, here, here's what I think. I think that the people reviewing this grant, they need to see how many dollars are you going to spend or request from us and how many jobs is that going to yeah. turn into, yeah, exactly. right? And a lot of what was just talked about was like really cool visionary outcomes and stuff. But for the purposes of the grant, all we have to do is say, like, we have a project that starts January 2023 and ends September 2026, and this is the number of people we plan to recruit and yeah. train. Yeah, that's good folks. Yeah. Like, you know, it, th this is what we're going to recruit and train them in, and here are our partners, and here's the impact it's going to have on their lives. And uh, I, we don't have to get any more complicated than that, other than to provide the specifics that any bureaucrat wants to see when you're talking about federal money. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I guess what I'm saying is like, I don't want to take anything away from what you guys just discussed. Cause I think that's exactly like, I agree with everything you both just talked about. Um, but like in terms of practical next steps, yeah. I just want to make sure we like know what the requirements are so that we don't get hung up on the vision when, you know, we don't even have a lot yet. Right. Well, and I've heard, I'm trying to, I heard a few other organizations talking about this grant that are, you know, and just, I feel like if I can connect the applications, it'll be stronger and the work and the conversations I'm already in, it would help me kind of consolidate a lot of my efforts because I'm pulled in a lot of different directions wanting to help, you know, but, and I'm, Personally, I want to learn how to do the aquaponics. We don't have to do any zoning for that. <laughs> you know, I, I think there's plenty of lots. We could just, how much does that cost to do aquaponics? I mean, it depends how you build it. I mean, size and is it a, a new greenhouse? Is it attached to a house? Are you just going to put it, try to put it in a greenhouse that's like not heated or just? You have to talk about a specific right. scenario. So this is like, okay, we're doing this. Um, and this, but once again with, okay, this is a business model that can be attached to it. Otherwise it's just playtime, not not something that meets needs and stuff. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the aquaponics can also stand on its own as a business. Not, not only, yeah. not only it's, 
attached to a house. I think yeah. it can stand on its own for existing houses or existing lots. I mean, I just literally just got off yeah. of a call with a neighborhood who wants to do a farm in their neighborhood in their poor, t you know, part of town to produce food. And what you you're created would allow them to spend less money and more efficient use of their their own resources, and they could probably pay for you know, the cost of the aquaponics just out of the gate. Right, it's not that pay for the cost of aquaponics, not uh, cool, but I mean, what we need is a, a stable operational model. So that's, that's the operations of that and all the data and actual productization of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that, I think there's potential there. I mean, if OSE is a part of Kansas City Climate Corps, then Kansas City Climate Corps could be one way to consolidate onto a single grant application is to make the project the formation of the Kansas City Climate Corps. And then the description of your activities and the budget and everything, OSE would just be a component of that with the other yeah, partners you have. Like a faculty partner and like right. you own this part of it, you know, or something like that. We'll we'll have to look at it and tease it out. I mean, it's not super <laughs> clear at the moment, but I do think that there's um I, I do think that there's a way to integrate. To to make that work, you need to be able to present a clear path from the the member of the benefit population that you intend to target with this how they're get, who they're going to interact with in this case it'd be the kcc uh c and then what their path through that organization is going to be once we recruit and train them or once k triple c recruits and trains them um in the same way like it, I, I included that text in the chat direct from the ARPA training grant website specifically say like what they're do what they're trying to do is fund discrete projects and so we would have to create a discrete project that just has multiple parties involved and if we wait too long to for the sake of integration we may lose the opportunity uh, simply because like it's been hard enough for us to create the and articulate the apprenticeship opportunity and even though we know we're going to get you know funding from Novo and so like I would just I would just say like keep keep the deadline in mind and like get us yeah. a decision as soon as possible so that we otherwise we can well focus on the apprenticeship. To focus it kinda of like Amazon doing the press release, uh, Brian, maybe you can think here's a job offer for a person that comes out of this program. I think that's yeah. that's the product you want to think about. So that means you have to have work what are they doing and how does that thing that they're doing make money? Otherwise, yeah. it's just a volunteer thing or some some unsustainable thing. Well, that's why I to see the yeah. And for that, and, you and can I now think we'll, pour through the thousands of pages on our aquaponics and and understand that if you want to do that. That's what I'm yeah. saying. It's like you got to take that and take it, add a layer to it. Now, okay, we're replicating and improving it and showing growth numbers, data, 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 data from that. And that, then you can say, oh yeah, hey, this makes a thousand bucks a, a month just from lettuce, like like it's supposed to. Uh, if we I, get through, yeah. I just want to specify that, like, for the per if we're just talking about the ARPA grant, th there is no requirement for a, a like job, and the money can't be used for payroll. So like, we'll we'll literally be talking about recruiting activities, training activities, yeah. short term support, yeah, like. We have to know what we're training them for, and therefore we have to have thought, what are they doing, what their job is. Yeah. Yes. By all means. We're I think that we should form... ...to develop that training, meaning it's largely documentation training, like it's all that, it's curriculum. We're de I mean, How I much is the grant like, for? Minimum 50000 max $4 million. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I think the the KCCC is in the same place as OSC is in terms of we're building for a product that we haven't gotten, you know, market validation yet. Um, but, you know, I think we can, um, I don't regardless know, I don't of the brand. Like we're like, I, I think we are so, so much further. It's like, well, we're like until you get a sale, that's two months. Until you get, I know, but that's when mark, mark, market validation occurs is after one sale, two sale, when you hit the you know million dollar mark, you're no longer a startup. So that's kind of what I meant when I said market validation. Sorry, can you can you explain that point? I missed it. Um, revenue greater than million dollars, I I would consider that like market validation. You know, so maybe we're using the words differently. So you know, t after ten houses, okay, you've you've really hit something. Once we've sold and closed the deal and built four, ten customers, that's really when I feel like we've had, we would have had ten, you know, same thing on any of the products we're talking about. I mean, what you, what you say sounds like we cannot start the apprenticeship until we do that. Is that? I didn't say that. I'm just talking about. I mean, you know, apprenticeship assumes that we're going to be able to pay people. So where is that happening? Where, where are, we have to go into the apprenticeship knowing that we have a viable revenue model. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. Risk, I'm going to piss a lot of people off. Yeah, yeah. But, pr but practically speaking, we can go. We can do everything we need to do to make the apprenticeship exist, except bring on the apprentice until we're ready. Yeah, I'm, like we, I'm we, just thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my point of contention is that I believe that if we build this one house at a thousand, we build this another house at, at two thousand, and it's like within 30 days we closed and sold and made between 25 and 50k on each. That to me is like, what more do I need to see? Yeah. Knowing that each of those builds, like knowing that I have, or we have developed over all this time, documentation that makes it very, very digital. It's very digital. It's highly replicable based on documentation. So, so that part, documentation, the sourcing, building. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're much closer. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's the assumption right now. We're saying we build these things in November. And are we like 100% confident? Like 100%, I mean, that's kind of hard, but like 99% confident that if we hire people to do this, we, we'd come out ahead economically. Like with literally like zero doubt that we can do it. That's that's my metric of success. That means we. We do what I just said. I won't be 100% confident in the house until we're, you know, if we until we've sold a few of them. I, I think that to, to me, no, I said 10 is when we move from a startup to a, you know, a growth company, you know, where, where we have a level of confidence that, yeah, you know. Yeah. You know, obviously a house is a house, you know, it's not like you, know, you can walk down the street and see houses for sale, right? The question is, is like the product, you know, the customer solution, price, location, mm -hmm. like are we, are we hitting all that, those different elements, right? You know, and I don't think we'll know that until we've sold a few or we've tried to sell a few because we're going to gain all the knowledge. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's just how I do things, is, uh, or how I think about it. Mm -hmm. there, you know, there's. I don't. I don't know how you. You're saying that 
you're 100% confident at the moment. <laughs> but, I mean, that's okay. I mean, you're well, supposed to be. Moment, you're the on, on December <laughs> 1, not, not right now. I can't tell. Like, that's, that's a big, big assumption, assumption to say that we built and sold. If that does happen, December 1 built and sold with, say, within like 30 days, yeah, then my confidence goes through the roof. That would, that would, that would be a lot of, I mean, that's a huge amount of information that we would have to validate what we're doing, you know? I, I'm interested in, I don't know if this would be, uh, I'll look on the wiki and around the aquaponics because, I mean, I could try and build one and sell it also. Or, I mean, I, I, yeah. I think there, there could well, be... To, I think the point you might be missing is that, yes, you can, absolutely, but can you sell a, a thing that, it's like, to me, what you just said requires a million dollars. Why? You spend 5000 on them on the first build. You go through some growth cycles. You figure out stuff. There's so much in there that to integrate a whole system, you need 10 full-time staff for a year who are capable of like research level R&D. That's what I see that as. Or you can sell a simple, like bright, whatever, whatever company that makes growing towers and they just sell growing towers with aquaponics. You can do that, but I don't think that is a good product. People already do that. If you want something extraordinary, like the level that, of integration, resilience, and robustness, you really gotta put the time into it. I'm telling you, you're gonna get wiped out after you grow your first, you're gonna do your first thing, you're gonna get an amazing crop, and you're like, yeah! And then you're gonna try to do it again, and it's not gonna happen. For various reasons, the complex integrated system. So you're gonna have to shake that down. You, so you fix something, and you fix, and you see how all the systems start interacting. That's what's gonna take. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Um, it's not. That's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah, give me a million bucks, and we have a product that we're ready to be at where we are with like the the house right now. Which means we're like, oh yeah, we're gonna sell it, and we know that we're gonna well close to that, all that. And you still have to show yeah. it. Because right now, the big I didn't realize. I didn't realize that aquaponics was so far off. Well, I think the the systems in there are more than anyone in the world has that I've seen uh, integrated into a small package. But also has its challenges. That's why. That's why. So it's like, holy shit! Yeah. Well, yeah. But now take it and, and but <laughs> think about the difference between the prototype and a product. That's that's the thing. It's yeah, like I understand. Goes into that one percent inspiration, ninety nine percent perspiration. That's where we're at. That's what any business is, really. Yeah. Well, big picture, we need a model where we can we can get that R and D money. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you go in together, then we might actually score. We've got another million, and we can hire that 10 staff to develop this into a full product that we say, okay, these kids are now getting taught. We developed all the documentation curriculum. In one year, we're hiring them to install these because we are so, fa so, 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 so far, far ahead. We might not have it 100%. We might have it 80%, but it's MVP at that point. So how much are you going to ask for in this ARPA grant? Four million. All of it. I think so. John, what are we doing? If you can justify with the budget narrative, yeah, I don't see why right. not. If we can justify that, and I can justify like a couple of million right away. What no, I it's just in my email is, is a couple of million at least. It just has to scale with, well, that, keep in mind, it, you have to separate, like, there's a limit to how much of that can be CapEx, and there's a limit to, and you can't use any of it for COGS. COGS? It's only for training and recruitment? Training and recruitment. So if you yeah, go to the training. wiki page, but training does that include R&D? Yeah, yeah, it's a fine line and there's nuance there and I'm sure we can articulate it. Just keep in mind the people who are reading this probably aren't accustomed to 
this world of open source manufacturing. Like your your audience, the people who are reviewing this grant, you need to assume that they're not smart and that say, share the same vision that you do, uh, or not yeah. smart on like open source manufacturing. And so like the slide fourteen of the deck on the wiki page um, lists all the eligible activities and stuff, and that you can request the money for. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think we can. I mean, and and just keep in mind, mind, just keep in mind too that like if capex is a big portion of four million, um, and you're requesting the max amount, there they only have thirty million to give out for this round of the grant through twenty twenty six, and one of the key things that they emphasized during the brief is like. You need so you need a staff of people to manage this because it's a federal grant, or you need somebody who's smart enough. Where if you get audited, it's not going to come back to bite you. Can right? I already those mentioned people that. as part of the grant? Yes, and it, administrative costs are limited to four percent of the total award amount. Four percent. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's four. Do you say if we do it through, if we do it through our foundation, well, is it state based or is it national? I mean, it's a national grant, but this is this is the state's allocation of it. I'm pretty sure. So it's it's it, for all intents and purposes, from our perspective, it's Missouri. Yeah. Okay. Well, John, that's. But I mean, do you see issues? I mean, yeah, I'm keeping that capex in mind. I mean, uh, this is all staff time developing curriculum, and there's right developing curriculum. Capex is like capex is like. It's not. Um, it's not staff time. It's it's more like, um, you know, expanding the physical infrastructure at your farm. Right. No, that's a minor portion. The major portion is informational. Yeah. Well, that's that's training. Yeah. We're developing yeah. a training. So, John, do you see any conflict between getting large amounts of money for training where the, all the, that money goes for the rapid learning infrastructure, meaning the curriculum? And I, and if it's uh, just to be be specific, you've got a four by eight panel. You've got a bunch of these fittings that cost you twenty dollars. You got a bunch of three quarter inch packs, and it's like you make all these kinds of configurations. Here you learn everything about to work to work with packs. That's rapid learning. Like all mm -hmm. the different, yeah, all, all the different versions. But so that's not a lot. That's going to be like a thousand dollars for that panel, and that's one of. Uh, 30 things that you learn or 50 things that you learn sure yeah that that's not cat like the capex they're trying to avoid is they don't want a company to go out and, and like build a new no. warehouse right and they they don't want people to use this money to develop products to sell it, 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 it's like who are you targeting beneficiary class unemployed people in certain census tracts and how are you going to do it and how much money is it going to cost the grant but that's it I mean, do you see any conflicts with with what with the fact that we we could use all of it to develop what we need, or you think that no? Oh, I mean, as long as you don't, I mean, they're pretty clear about what you're like categorically not allowed right, to do. Right. So as long as you don't build a new facility or you know you could put it into cogs, if it's to start like the OIC open source manufacturing you know, training academy that requires you to renovate your existing facility, buy new tools, buy training aids, buy supplies for, you know, training. That's what this is designed for. And that's exactly what we want. And that's very easy for a million for what we want to do. And the people who are, we submit this to are like super open to answering questions. So like if we run into problems, come up with a budget narrative, we can just ask them before submitting they'll give us the they'll give us the answer and I'll try and help us out they like the vibe i got from them was you know we haven't gotten any applications yet and there's 30 million dollars to spend uh because like i asked them based on what how i described the apprenticeship is it worth having us apply and they're like yeah obviously because there could just be not that many applicants this year and uh, you could just luck out and so like your the point system is not competing against some arbitrary uh, point number, it's competing against the number of other applicants who are applying. How much of that entire sum are they willing to give out? Is it going to be everything if there's enough applications? 
Or I have no idea. I mean, yeah, they, it's the $30 million is designed for the next four years worth of grants. And uh, in principle, there's nothing preventing them from giving out all $30 million during this first round of applicants. Um, but that decision probably rests on some bureaucrat's desk at the Missouri Department of Economic Development. Uh, and I've talked to those people a couple times. Um, Do you think we should find out that answer or no? No, because we're capped out at four million, which is a small fraction of the no, you know thirty million total. Like I also heard some reservations whether we should apply. Because from who the, the statement to me is, if there's they're willing to give out everything, and there's only like ten people applying, then we're 100% likely to get it, <laughs> right? Or no? Or no. Um, well, I mean, like 10 people could apply and the reviewers could say, none of these applicants meet the intent of the grant. Okay. You know? Well, I think we, we highly meet the requirements and therefore, yeah, we should definitely give it Yeah, and, and that's, that's what Lisa and uh, uh, Melissa said as well. Mm -hmm. They're like this, you know. It, it it's amazing. We love it. This is incredible. It, the the challenge that you face dealing with shit like this is, it's it's like too good to be true, and people can't wrap wrap their heads around the idea of three, you know, guys on Zoom when they should be earning money doing this. Like it just doesn't it doesn't register for some people. <laughs> You mean and some people when they look at this video they actually don't see it. they see blank screens. <laughs> hmm. I mean, I, you should hear me try and explain this to like my friends that I haven't seen in a while. Like, oh, what are you doing for work now? I'm like, uh, I'm trying to save the world. Like, don't worry about it. It doesn't make any sense. I'm volunteering. You know, like. Well, I mean. Uh, I always go at it saying that, well, here's the money. Here's how the money is going to flow out of this. And we have to make a case that, okay, this training gets us to those. Because, okay, so, so the deeper picture for your info is the curriculum means that we get rapid access to the kind of learning that right now, like what I do right now is because I didn't learn anything in college, I learned theory. I'm out all over the Internet looking all kinds of practical info trying to scour it and everything. There's so much crap you have to weed through. And there's very few people who really, really understand it. And those people who really, really understand it, don't publish it. So I am frustrated out of my mind, trying to learn all the stuff that's necessary to do this. I know people do it and there's already examples and other forms of this being done. I'm just trying to integrate it and I can't because I can't get access to that info. Like the aquaponic greenhouse, you know, uh, we are already way further than anyone on the planet regarding systems integration. There, we haven't gone to the completion of showing the money on it, but the amount of knowledge it takes, the thinking ability, problem solving ability—that's what we want to open source and teach freely to change the world. So that's why we should we should. Um, it's, it's expensive because it, it takes a lot of time to distill, to, to improve the quality of information, to make it very, very high quality. That's what we're trying to do. So, and we're justified getting all that. And therefore, when people do our work, they make these amazing houses that end up having the features like, oh, now we're using 3D printers to print integrated wall panels that already have plumbing and electrical built into them, that kind of stuff, which is completely, it's a no-brainer. Technologically, it's a no-brainer, but it's like nobody can do it right now. The, the machines that are able to do it cost a million dollars. We want to do it for like $10,000 for the large scale three printer that can print our whole wall panels. That's going to be probably like $20,000 machine, um, not a million. So stuff like that. But anyway, I'm, I'm saying we, we can, this is the kind of stuff I'm, I would try to explain in this well, I don't know, we might have to water it down, but that's that's really what I'm after. Like, it takes a lot of a lot of effort to, to distill and create this rapid learning thing. So, the, so over my entire life, I, I've determined for myself that there's a huge need for rapid learning infrastructures and in order to allow people to gain more of the potential that they really have. 
and most and the schools that are out there they put you into little cubicles little very narrow foci that by design do not allow you to learn rapidly because you don't see the connections so we're trying to get the connections of integrated learning rapid learning and that's expensive uh, because the entire system is not designed for it we're, we're going against the tide so anyway um, I, I think we should apply for all you know as much of that yeah we should apply and just roll <coughs> I could do the budget narrative for what I think this, some of this infrastructure would look like. And, and did, it did it make any sense what I was trying to s state very super briefly in that email? Or it doesn't make any sense? Yeah, uh, no, it, it all, it, of course it makes sense. It, it, I've been listening to some version of that from you since we met. It, what I'm saying, though, is for the budget narrative, um, like you don't, you don't have to convince them that integrated learning is important or worthwhile. Well, you just need to tell them how much money you want to spend. And then in the narrative about impact, you just need to say, like, this training program is going to increase the, the likelihood of a person getting hired from this target group, or this training program is an actual paid apprenticeship that we're going to offer to this target beneficiary group. And so, like, yeah, it's kind of dumbing down, but in a different way, it's also like an extremely valuable exercise for us to just offer clarity on like, if the government gives us money, this is how we're going to use it to have a real impact. And like, yes, it fits in with this much larger vision, but like for the purposes of this grant, that's all we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, we should knock it out of the ballpark. I agree. Now the question is, given Brian's like other connections and, and like what he's interested in doing the KCCC, like how do you want to tackle this? Or do you need some time to think about it, Brian? And like we, we re re engage. Yeah. I need to look at the application a little bit more, I guess. I don't know. I, I think there is overlap. I just don't want to, make it a multiple organizational application if it doesn't need to be, you know? Well, we already know it needs to be because there's about 20 points in collaboration. So that's that's needed. That's why we're coming to you saying, hey, they're, they're going to score us way higher. So how about this? What if we said, so just, just to get very specific, we're going to allocate like a million bucks to develop the curriculum on aquaponics to the point that because on the one side you still need to build it right there's still a lot of skill and just okay how is it all built physically that we can teach people to do that teach moreover the design principles of how it works so that once we start building these the, the people that are trained can actually start problem solving and we're saying we'll hire you to build these aquaponic greenhouses in our house we can pay you start we'll start you at 30 to 80 or whatever, a very competitive pay, which is probably at the top of what, what they'd be getting, and that's it. So we, we're gonna hire, and we're gonna hire, you know, this first cohort of 24 additional people uh, on, in one year from now, because they, we've created this curriculum. So one, we get the money, we, we run the curriculum, and then we, we're sending out 24 people building these aquaponics out. It's in our house. One, one thing I can suggest right now is of course in our houses. I'm sure some people will want that addition to their house. Yeah. Uh, it could be just building the greenhouses, which are food producing greenhouses. We might want to scale, like possibly even scale down this fully integrated crazy aquaponics. We might just take some components, but the people will be able to, to work with them, make them work well. And probably ha that's how it will, will be like. Maybe we just start with, oh, we know that like all these different greens for salads, that's already a viable business model, microgreens or whatever. Yeah, and we we'll say we're, we've trained people to do exactly this by creating rapid learning. That's, you know, like all the stuff you pay on YouTube, you can get this microgreens course or this worm castings course or this mushroom. This uh, We're making all that available, we're training, but we're out actually building that in our real houses. There's a real business attached to it. OSC is going to hire you. That That's what I would say. That's uh, that's clear overlap. It's completely completely on mission with us because we're, we're teaching people to produce things. Yeah. All collaborating. Yeah. I think that's that makes sense to me. But 
let me chew on it and uh, I'll look at the grain a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. One week? When do you go? You leave on vacation. 26. Uh, where are you going? Mexico to do some snorkeling. Nice. Um, Brian, I mean, how much time do you, do you want to meet before or after he gets back? Um, why, why don't I, um, I think before, or I don't know. I, I don't have a good sense, but right the, the sooner 23rd? the better. Uh, Friday the 23rd? Sure. Cool. Uh, any, any time requests? Let's see. Oh, um, I could do after uh, like 4 p.m.? All right, I'll send out an invite for Friday at 4 p.m. CST. All right. Uh, maybe there'll be some email back and forth before then. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll look at it. I mean, regardless of if you decide before then, we should at least meet to assign tasks so that we don't lose too much time or divvy up the workload in some way. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll see you on Friday. Yeah. Have a good week, guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care.